All right, welcome everyone to the 2016 Elimination Diet Challenge. Some of you have done this before, yes? One of the things, some people, questions some people have had is where do you find the guidelines for this diet? Have some of you seen them already? Good. Has anyone not seen them? If you haven't seen them, they're all posted online. If you go to, in this case, they're under my personal website, which is chrispickerel.com. If you look under downloads, you'll find them there. I think downloads or resources, you'll find them there. Sound good? All right. Let's talk about the elimination diet. So I'd like as much as possible to keep this pretty interactive. So I'll ask some questions. What is the elimination diet? What are you guys about to do? Cut out a bunch of stuff. Flavorful stuff. Flavor, <laughs> flavorful stuff as well. Good. That's about right. Yeah, that is what the elimination diet is. We take a lot of things out of our diet for a period of, you guys all know how long you're supposed to do this for? Three days. What's that? 30 days. Uh, not quite. 21 days. Three weeks. Three weeks. There you go. You've got a little, you just got an extra week back. So we'll talk more about what it is. But probably most importantly, we want to talk about why we do this thing called the elimination diet. Anyone have any thoughts on that? Yep. So to eliminate certain um, allergies, toxins, things that bother my system or our system, so yep. identify what the triggers are. Good. Identify the triggers is definitely one of the key phrases there. I think you hit on the other one, but anyone know what the other one is? Yep, so you use the word toxins in there. This is The elimination diet does two primary things. It identifies food sensitivities, and it helps... I'm always careful using the word detox or cleanse. I mean, this is what we're about to do, but those words have a little bit of a connotation to them. But that's what this is. It helps your body cleanse, detox, stored toxins accumulated over time. So the answer to why do we do this is... One of those two or both of those two? General, who's doing this to figure out food sensitivities? Good number there. Who's doing this more as a detox and a cleanse? I think I saw a couple hands go up both times. Great. It will be and it will act as both. Now here's another question you want to answer <laughs> promptly. You'll answer it one way or the other. What should you expect? What's going to happen when you start doing this? Anyone know what's going to happen? Probably go into withdrawal. You will actually a little bit go into withdrawal. So what will you experience? Let's, you've kind of hit on some of the negative ones, but let's, let's get those out on the floor right away. What will you experience that is perhaps less pleasant in the beginning? Headaches. Yeah, all right. So some of you have <coughs> tried something like this before, particularly if you're a regular coffee or tea drinker. Expect some headaches. Is it okay to have green tea for the first few days or should just to, like bridge the gap or do you not recommend <laughs> Generally, I don't recommend that. Okay. Yeah. No, we'll get into sort of compensations and things you can do that help you bridge the gap. And actually, that brings up a good point we'll, we'll address right away. If you need to, go ahead. Right. Yeah. Because what's green tea? I thought green tea was great. How come we can't? Green tea is great. Coffee is great. Yeah. They're not, in fact, that's another excellent point. The things that we're taking out, they're not necessarily terrible things for you, right? Coffee and green tea are great things. There's a lot of excellent things in them. They're things to which either you may be sensitive or with caffeine in particular. Caffeine's a thing that has to be broken down by the body. And we'll talk about that at length in a little while. So we're doing two things similar to the reason we do this. We're taking out everything to which someone might be sensitive and we're taking out any of those hard to process things like caffeine or alcohol or sugar, things like that. If you absolutely need to, yes, you can, of course. But one of the things we'll try, one of the things I'll really encourage you, especially with the, when we get to that list of the hard outs, I'll encourage you to do your best to be fairly, very strict with some of those. So we've got headaches. What else can you expect on the negative side of things? Being irritable. Yep. Good chance you'll be a little bit irritable for the first four or five days, particularly around day four or five, six. Cravings. Cravings, definitely. Yeah. So, so far, we've really named a lot of classic withdrawal symptoms. Headaches, irritability, cravings, anything else? 
Well, yeah, anger, sometimes the irritability can escalate, sure. <laughs> sure, let's hope that's not the what case. Dizziness? dizziness, possibly. Anything else? Yeah. Elimination yep. variations. That's exactly the, the last one on that list that I wanted to... I wasn't going to phrase it quite like that. <laughs> Elimination variations. You'll probably notice some changes in your stool. Probably they will be in the beginning looser, maybe even a little bit runny during that four to day four, five, six phase. Those are all normal things that happen. Does it mean they're guaranteed to happen to you? Nope. Lots of people go through this and experience very minimal of that. Some people experience almost none of that. If this is your very first time doing anything like this, plan for at least a little bit of that. Okay. Now here's where we get into starting to understand the elimination diet. Why do those things happen? All those things that we just mentioned particularly, why, why do those happen? I think your body gets used to those chemicals, those sure. substances, and then when you, not, when you stop using them, it's like cigarettes. Yep, in a lot of ways, especially with those things like cigarettes or caffeine, there is a physiological addiction. Let's say you don't drink coffee or smoke or anything like that right now and you still do this. What else is happening in your body that creates some of those signs and symptoms? It's a word we've already used. It's releasing yeah, it's a detoxification. It is an actual detoxification. What that means, hi, welcome, is you will in that first little while have more than the normal amount of toxins in your system because your body is getting rid of them. Is that a good thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, since we're on this topic, how can we facilitate that going as smoothly as possible? Exercise, exercise is good. <coughs> activity. It doesn't have to be vigorous exercise, but activity, motion is good. And then I think I heard hydration. Just drink lots of water. Drink lots of water and try to have a fair bit of fiber. Now, on this diet, you probably will be having a fair bit of fiber anyway, kind of part of it. But water and fiber, by fiber, I even just mean vegetables. That's fine. But plan, plan for some of those things to happen. If you notice for you those are happening more than you'd like, go to water and fiber or teas and things like that, but keep hydrated. The main roots of elimination in the body are... Yep, yeah, through the stool, through the urine, and then we get into the backup ones through the skin and through the lungs as well. We'll touch back on that idea of skin when we talk about the good things that happen from the elimination diet. Yep. Does that mean you could expect acne as part of the symptoms? Probably not. Yeah, usually it won't. So the, the question was, uh, would you expect acne? as part of the negative things. Probably not. Usually, we'll switch into this now, usually we see skin improve quite a bit. So we touched on this idea in terms of organs of elimination. The skin is an organ of, elim of elimination. Usually it only gets called into action if the primary organs of elimination are already overworked or unable to keep up. And those are the liver, which we'll talk about, and the kidneys. Often, the most effective way to clear skin is to re-establish the balance in the liver, to get the previous load of toxins cleared and to get the liver working at optimal efficiency again. We'll touch on that again. But let's first, before you get too down on what you're about to do, let's talk about the positive things you can also expect. Thoughts? Weight loss is almost always part of this equation. It's interesting because this isn't a diet in that sense. There's no caloric restriction. You can eat as much as you want. You just have to choose from these certain foods. But almost everyone will experience weight loss, not because they're consuming less calories, but because, anyone know? Getting rid of a bunch of junk. You're getting rid of a bunch of junk, and your <coughs> calories are of higher value. And you're getting... Per caloric unit, you're getting more nutrition. So the word that we can use here is you're optimizing efficiency. Your metabolism improves through this diet, and this is one of the direct outcomes, because you're not putting in things that slow down metabolism. So often weight loss is an outcome. It's not 
a goal of this diet, but it's almost always an outcome that most people enjoy. What else might you expect? Better skin. Better skin, yes. You may find, again, in that first period, you might say, I don't know, it feels a little unsteady, but once you get through that period, you will find that almost always skin clears up. In fact, if someone comes in with skin as their main issue, the elimination diet is one of the most effective therapies for that. Okay, what else might improve? More energy. More energy, yep. Probably the biggest area we see improvement is people have more energy. And not in a, I think I have more energy, but in a notable, yeah, I feel brighter, healthier, more vital, stronger. And that's likewise is because metabolism improves. You actually will generate more energy in a day as the efficiency of your system improves. So we've got more energy. What else? Better sleep. Better sleep. This is one that for a lot of people, this is the best part of this whole diet is that they sleep. I remember the first time I did one of these, I slept so well. It was amazing. And I already slept pretty well. For a lot of people, this is one of the greatest things they get out of it is they sleep better. They sleep more deeply, more soundly, and wake feeling more refreshed. Now, part of that is if you're a heavy cough dr coffee drinker, you take a stimulant out of your system and you actually will notably feel better. But as you withdraw, you'll feel, this is one word we didn't mention, you might feel some lethargy, some sluggishness in those first few days, particularly if you're a regular coffee drinker. Other benefits we might see? Probably one more main category we'd like to mention, although you've named just about all of them. Yep. Coping with stress? Coping with stress, sure. Yeah, you will see that. And that's more a product, again, of efficiency as your body is healthier, the buffer between your softest parts and the rest of the world expands. And so once the initial irritability goes, passes, you begin to build back that buffer. You have more energy, you're sleeping better, you're eating better, and your vitality improves. The buffer between you and the world thickens a little bit and you can cope with stress a little bit better. The other area that I was thinking was digestion. This is often, if, if the reason you're doing this elimination diet is because your digestion hasn't felt right for a while, this is the most effective way to reset that. We'll talk about the mechanisms in just a second, but taking out foods to which you may be sensitive, and you might not know that right now, helps the gut itself heal and your digestion improve. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Good. Has it made it worthwhile that you want to do this for three weeks? Yes. Question over here. Yeah. When you say there are some foods we might be sensitive to, what is it that tells us that we're sensitive to it? Good. Okay. That, I think, will segue us. Yep, we've got everything on my list for the pluses and the minuses. That'll segue us into uh, how does it work. So let's talk about food sensitivities right away. Does anyone know anything about food sensitivities? Yep, they're, they're threshold level enough these days that most of us have heard of them and recognize, I mean, all of us intuitively know there are a few foods we don't handle well. Before I knew anything really about anything, I didn't like, I knew I didn't like peppers and I knew I didn't like tomatoes and I knew I didn't like eggplants. I didn't even know they were related as foods, but my body just kind of told me these aren't very good. Now, what we know is those all have one thing in common. They're all members of the nightshade family. And the nightshade family are one of the highest food sensitivities that humans have. But that gets us in, I think, to your point is that some of you might say, you know what? I just don't handle nightshades really well at all. Others might say, actually, I'm fine with them. And that's entirely possible. The elimination diet takes everything out. But everything, you won't be sensitive to everything. Sound okay? If you have done one of these before and you've already identified your primary sensitivities and you know there are things to which you are not sensitive that are on the out list, it's okay to include some of them through this elimination diet. 
If you've never done one of these before and never identified your food sensitivities, probably this is a wonderful opportunity that you're going to work hard for to test some of those food sensitivities. The last lecture we do when we wrap things up is talking about how to specifically test some of those food sensitivities. But what is it when you're sensitive? Like, is yep. it because you get bloated or is it because it... How do you know you're sensitive yeah. to food? That's a good question. Actually, that, and that, that also is a very good point in that the other thing we see improve is usually whatever for you is the foremost sign that tells you something is out of balance. For some people, it's itchy skin. For other people, it's restless sleep. For other people, it's headaches. So everyone kind of has something that tells them they're a little out of balance. Food sensitivities often worsen what that is. However, usually food sensitivities show up in something related to digestion, which is a useful point to make right now. We'll talk about this. I say digestion, and I kind of mean the whole digestive system. But we're going to break it down into three different parts. What are the three parts of the digestive system? Absorption. That's right. Assimilation. Yeah, usually that goes under absorption. But So digestion is the first part. That's where we actually take food in and our stomach breaks it down. So digestion is the mechanical breakdown or chemical breakdown of food in our stomachs. That's what we call digestion in the truest sense. Absorption is the assimilation and the uptake of food. And what do you think the final piece is in the whole thing we call digestion? Elimination. Elimination. Good. The, well, this is the elimination diet, but that's not really exactly <laughs> what we're going for. But those three components are useful because they, there can be challenges in any of those three areas. One of the things that we learn from doing this is, that you learn from doing this, is identifying which of those areas is of primary concern to you. So to the point of how do we know? If you get bloated quickly after a general meal or eating something, what do you think that suggests? Yep, you're probably sensitive to the food. Or you're not uh, absorbing it. You're not digesting it. Yep. Or you're eating it too fast. Or you're eating it too fast. When you get rapid bloating after eating anything, the, the only reliable piece of information is we know digestion is not happening optimally. We don't yet know if it's because you ate it too fast, you are sensitive to that food, or in general, your stomach acid overall is low. And often, and that's a big, big part of the equation, often it's working with the stomach acid to get that back to where it should be in order to make sure everything else works appropriately. You can have a challenge of absorption independent of a challenge of digestion, but if you're not digesting food in the first place, you're not absorbing food when it gets into the small intestine, and probably you're going to have some challenges with elimination if you're getting large food particles downstream. So digestion is the first piece. That's the breakdown of food in the stomach. That has to happen well. If it doesn't, everything else will be a little bit out of balance. By taking out foods to which just about anybody is sensitive, we're minimizing the work required to break down food in the stomach. What's one of the most effective, if you suspect perhaps the imbalance with you is digestion, what's one of the most effective ways to support that? Enzymes? Actually, enzymes, chewing. not so much. Chewing the food is very important, but there are two other ways that we can really support our digestion. Hydrochloric acid. One of them is to add more acid, either in the form of vinegars, usually apple cider vinegars, or hydrochloric acid. That's quite useful. The other one... Food combining? Uh, food combining a little bit. I don't know enough about that. I don't know if anyone knows enough about that to have really effective opinions, but the other way to do it is essentially to outsource digestion. What is a, a slow cooker? Okay. Yeah. A slow cooker is basically your stomach outside of your body. It cooks and digests that food so that when it goes in, your stomach basically doesn't have to do anything. It's already ready to go. I actually suspect that a big part of the reason why Indian cooking is as nutritious as it is, is because it's so slow cooked in advance. And it's cooked with oils, and it's cooked with some vinegars, and some acids, and some other things, that it, it effectively totally outsources digestion. 
So if you think your digestion might be out of balance, the most effective thing to do is outsource the process and have warm, well-cooked foods. You probably at some point have come across the idea that we should all be eating raw foods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's the deal on that. It's not true. If you live in a hot climate, you can get away with eating more raw foods. If you live in Toronto, although this is a wonderful winter so far, but still cool. If you live in Toronto, our climate is cool and damp. We're exposed to cool and damp all the time. So we have to continuously heat our bodies to maintain our temperature. When you put something raw and cold in your body, what has to happen? It has, your body has to put extra energy to actually physically heat it up. If you put something cold in, your body has to bring it up to temperature. And if it's raw, your body has to add all the extra resources required to break it down. There's a reason why <coughs> plants do what they do. Plants put all sorts of things in their leaves, particularly, so that animals don't eat them. That's, that's what they do. A lot of the medicine that we use in plants plants put there to protect them from predation. But here's the thing plants still don't know. We cook them. They're totally unprepared. They have no idea that after we cut them, we cook them. When we cook them, we break down the cell walls. In a lot of ways, we deactivate some of the constituents that are in there that are not good for us. But more importantly than that, we open up the nutrition that's available within those cells. Kale is a great example. It's a wonderful, wonderfully nutritious plant. You will get far more out of kale if you cook it first. If you eat it raw, you'll still get something out of it. The grinding of the teeth, the stomach acid breaks it down. But if you cook it, either steam it, stew it, make it into those tasty kale <coughs> chips, you break down the cell walls and you get a much higher absorption of nutrition from that same food source. Um, what about massaging the kale, because you are still breaking yep. down the enzymes, or blending raw food. Yep. So blending is great. Bruising is often the word, or mashing it, also great. Anything that you do that breaks it down will improve your absorption. <laughs> Cooking is the easiest way to do it because heat breaks it down. But, and this is another kind of misconception, sometimes people say, oh, you lose some of the nutrition when you do that. You don't. And then other people say, oh, the enzymes. And I've put a lot of time into this because I've asked a few people, what enzymes are you referring to? And they don't usually know the answer. And I've looked it up and there's not really anywhere that says the enzymes that are in there. All of the research suggests the best way to get the most out of food is to cook it. And if it's a vegetable, if you cook it in a stew, anything that is lost to the water is still just in the water still just in the soup or the stew. So I advocate warm, well-cooked foods, probably above just about anything else, as the best way to improve your digestion and your absorption, your uptake of nutrition. Sound okay? It doesn't mean you should never eat raw food. It's totally fine. You can eat some raw food for sure. You can eat lots of it in the summer. In the winter, favor warm, well-cooked, and warming spices are nice as well. All right, there's our digestion. Is another question there? No? Okay. Yep. If you are going to add vinegar, should you have it before your meal or after? Vinegar you can do either immediately before, with, or after. They're all okay. The only thing you want to avoid, especially if you know you're someone who gets dizzy or lightheaded easily, uh, don't take it 10 minutes before your meal because it can be a little bit unsettling. Usually the best way to do is take it with or immediately after. Yep. And that's maybe another lecture topic about how it works, but... Compared to enzymes, vinegar actually helps your body make more acid, but then you no longer need to continue to supplement it. So it's a reverse dependence. It's one of the few places in the body that use what's called a positive feedback loop. So you build it up, and it actually should stay up. And this is the next best question to ask is, well, why was it low in the first place? <coughs> so if you use vinegar or hydrochloric acid supplements to bring it back up, but the reasons that it got low in the first place are still there, it will, of course, come down again. And that's a good question to ask. Why did it get low in the first place? Since we're on topic, let's answer the question. Why might it get low in the first place? These are actually pretty easy answers. Because you're not having enough of it. Stress. 
is probably the number one reason why digestion gets impaired. You cannot be stressed and digest food at the same time. It's just physiologically not possible. The degree to which one system is on is the degree to which the other is off. If you are stressed, your digestion is turned off. When your digestion is turned on, the stress actually has to come off. The balance between those two is a big part of the reason why so many people have less than optimal digestion and then absorption. You said that vinegar cleans it back up? That's right. Does it eliminate the stress? Actually, <laughs> it's a funny joke, but actually, temporarily, transiently, yes it does. One of the same thing that we do to stimulate digestion with herbs is exactly the same treatment we use for panic attacks. So we use a very strong, bitter combination that you would take just before you eat, and it turns on the digestive system. Bitters stimulate digestion. By bitters stimulating digestion, they force the digestive system on, on which actually forces the stress system off. So as a treatment for panic attacks, we actually will have people use those very bitter, very unpleasant tasting herbs to stimulate that. The other parallel is uh, an old actor's trick for stage fright. Anyone know what it is? It's put a couple fingers in your throat and make yourself gag. Not pleasant, but very effective for exactly the same reason. It turns on the digestive system. Your body thinks it's about to throw up. And therefore, it turns off the fear, the stage fright, the rising panic. So when you need to, if you ever need to, you've always got that in your back pocket if you don't have some bitters. So the answer to your question actually is a little bit, yes. So that's our digestion. And we've spent some time talking about it because it's obviously really important. What about absorption? Here's where we get it into food sensitivities. Absorption is the uptake of nutrition. This is what happens in your gut. I like this. I've done this many times. In your gut, you have little fingers. They're called fimbriae. These are what, when nutrition comes along, the fingers say, oh, great, hooray. Lift it, bring it in, release it into the body for use. Fingers. When the skin of a green pepper comes along and you happen to be sensitive to the nightshades, it hits these little fingers and the finger says, oh, no, ow, ow, and it gets a little bit broken. No problem. You've still got these other three that can lift it in. If you continue to be exposed to a food to which you are sensitive, these actually wear down in a very physical way. When we actually study, well, I can't say I've done it, but when they measure the length of these fingers, these fimbriae, in someone who has ongoing inflammation in their gut, these are worn down. And they're just simply not able to take in nutrition. Which is why, in someone who has an ongoing food sensitivity, <coughs> to which they continue to be exposed, we see all the signs of malabsorption over time. We see the signs of deficiency over time. Even though intake is good, uptake is impaired. Make sense? It's actually really important in understanding physiology because lots of people will say, I don't understand why I feel so tired and low mood, have a low mood, I eat so well. Great. Intake is part of it. Of course, you have to put things in, but uptake is another really key part of it. And that's where food sensitivities play a major role. If you're really sensitive to <clears throat> eggs, for example, which is another one that not everyone is sensitive to eggs, but a lot of people that are sensitive to eggs are very sensitive to eggs. And so if that's a sensitivity for you, when you take it out, things just get better, a lot better, and often very quickly. Okay, that's a little bit about absorption. Any other questions or any questions about absorption before we talk about elimination? Yep? If we have, eliminate, or sorry, if we have inflammation in our gut, mm -hmm. you're saying that the absorption just it wears down. That's right. It's not Usually inflammation in the gut is due to the sensitivity damaging those themselves. So usually that is the inflammation. The inflammation is the cause of not absorbing. That's right. And the sensitivity is the cause of the inflammation. Usually. Now there are other causes, of course, but that's the main one that we see. Yep. Question. When, when you do the elimination diet, and let's say you're, you have issues with the leaky gut and you've got... Gluten or wheat, mm -hmm. and you take it out. 
Do, does the end rate, do they uh, grow yeah. back again? Excellent question. I meant to mention that. So the question is, do they grow back? Conveniently, they are some of the fastest growing back cells in the body. And part of the reason that we do this for three weeks is exactly that reason. If you just do it for one week and then reintroduce a food to which you're sensitive, you will not have achieved that full healing. And that's part of the reason why I'll encourage you towards the end to really Try to do it as fully as you can for the full amount of time. It just works best when we do the whole thing. But yes, the answer to your question is conveniently, they do grow back pretty well. All right. Any other questions? Absorption, yep. Um, I've had um, this elimination diet once because mm -hmm. of candida. Sure. So we can touch on that as well. And that probably moves us a little bit into the detoxification and the elimination phase. <coughs> There are other reasons why you can do the elimination diet, and infections of any kind, be them anywhere in the body, are a great reason to do something like this. Infections, there are two reasons why. One, if you're consuming regularly a lot of sugar, that's almost always a ready food source for any kind of infection. So taking sugar out, just doing that is really good. Very useful for clearing an infection. Here's the other good reason. Inflammation in the body anywhere, particularly the gut, triggers the immune system. If there's ongoing inflammation, there's ongoing immune activity. If what's happening in the gut is taking up, and the gut is one of the primary places that the immune system is active because it's a portal to the outside world. You can get very sick if something gets into your body that isn't supposed to get into the body, which means if there's inflammation there, the immune system is focused there, and it's not putting resources somewhere else in the body, like an infection that is potentially less threatening. So another part of the elimination diet is when we bring total, elimination, uh, total inflammation down through the body, the immune system is also more available to do other things in general. Now, I wouldn't say infections are the main reason we do something like an elimination diet, but if someone has an ongoing infection, particularly over the skin, we often see those improve considerably. Okay, let's talk about elimination and then we'll talk about detoxification. But let's do sort of following the digestive trail down. We've got how things come out the other end. How do we know things are coming out well on the other end? They have the texture of a banana. The te that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. I've actually never said it like that. But the <laughs> texture of a banana is the texture, shape, size all around. The peeled banana. That's pretty good. Yep. That's a nice way to think of it. Poop and bananas. <laughs> How often should you be having bowel movement? At least once a day. At least once a day. If you are not having a bowel movement once a day, occasionally once in a while, it's fine if you miss a day. But if that's not a regular thing for you, then your elimina elimination is less than optimal. And you do actually want to work to bring that up to at least once a day. Two a day? Three. Three a day? Those are okay. Those are normal for you. I wouldn't, as long as there's at least one a day, you don't necessarily have to do anything. Two a day is maybe better, but if it's one good one a day and then one not good one a day, just one a day is better. How, might, how else might we know that something is out of balance with elimination? It hurts to go to the bathroom. Yeah, it shouldn't be uncomfortable. It doesn't have to be pleasant either, but it shouldn't be uncomfortable. You shouldn't be straining. Anything else? This is unrelated to the stool, but um, I find that if there's something I'm, I've eaten that I'm not, that doesn't absorb all of my body the next morning, I have all the mucus that comes up. Sure. And then, yeah, so sometimes there, there is that mucus and sometimes there's nothing. Yep, and that's actually, that is quite on point with what I wanted to add to that is if you see other changes in the stool, particularly mucus or undigested food, Here's the easiest food sensitivity test. If it comes out the other end, you did not digest it or absorb it. If you can still see it and recognize it on the other end. Oh, there's a pepper skin. That's a common one. Corn sometimes just means you didn't chew it. And you should have. But still, many people don't see corn come out the other end. So if you do, unless you've had three cobs of corn the night before, if you see corn come out the other end, probably you're not digesting it. You might need to start with chewing it better, but that is a food to which a lot of people are also sensitive. 
That's elimination. So look for changes. Mucus or undigested food tells you something is off. Loose stools or constipation, but loose stools also tell you that something is off. Now those give, give you quite a bit of information as to where the imbalances might be, but for now we'll leave it at that. Yep? What about if it's food like corn or things that are coming out not so... Coming Broken down? Old, yep. Um, the other end, what if you blended them Yep. or ate them in flour form or ate them, you know, yep. in a different way? Could yes. that be okay or is it better not to touch it? So we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit and we'll get into it right now. The idea of Part of what we'll do, we'll go into this in the last lecture, but when we identify sensitivities, the other thing we're identifying is not just the food, but also the threshold. Mm -hmm. So it may, dairy is an excellent example. Some people are not great with dairy overall, but they can handle a little bit of cheese, or they can handle some good quality yogurt, but they can't handle a glass of milk, or they can't handle milk on their cereal which is to say that you'll have a threshold. So corn is maybe another good one. You're fine if it's in the form of ground corn in a tortilla, but you're not so great if you have a cob of corn. And that's one of the things that everyone figures out their thresholds. All right. Let's, so that's a little bit about food sensitivities, and that's one of the things we'll try to figure out. What foods irritate or inflame your gut? Let's talk about the detoxification part. Because this is another big part of why we do the elimination diet. What organ in the body does the majority of detoxification? Liver. The liver. Here's how I like to explain this. I found this a pretty useful analogy. Think of your liver kind of like a factory. And assume it can process 100 units a day. Just 100 deliveries a day. That's five delivery trucks with 20 units each. Right? We're going to use a little math here. What happens when it, it's, it, that's its top capacity, 100 units a day. What happens when a sixth truck with 20 extra units shows up unexpected, drops off 20 more? What happens? Chaos. Problems. It slows everything down. That delivery has been made. It has to be processed. Your bodies have to process it. So it has to be processed, but it means that efficiency is going to be less. And this is the big, this is the most important part of all of it. It means that compensations are likely to occur. If we were to use our factory analogy, accidents are likely to occur. Oh man, we've got these 20 extra units. Call in some of those guys from the office to help us out. But those guys, they're not trained to handle those units and they're likely to make mistakes. Or some of the lazier workers are likely to take some of that stuff and just stash it somewhere. Try to throw it outside so that no one notices. And I use those two examples humorously, but that's exactly what happens in our body. Both of those things happen. Cells that are not supposed to handle detoxification get recruited to try and do that. And that creates errors and inflammation. And sometimes it creates things that are actually more toxic as they're being broken down than they initially were. The other one is probably even most physiologically relevant. When your body is given more toxins than it can handle, where does it put them? Your stomach. Well, close. It mostly stores them as, or not as, in fat. Mm -hmm. Fat is a very safe substance. You can put something in fat and it's safe. It's not toxic anymore. Fat totally surrounds it. Here's where we get into why you lose weight. Weight loss is not as simple as calories in and calories out. If the equation is more in than out, you put on weight. That's true. But sometimes we see that equation quite imbalanced, yet someone has a really hard time losing weight. If your body has toxins stored in fat, particularly around the livers where we see a lot of those, but in general, if your body has toxins stored as fat and it doesn't believe it has the ability to safely process and mobilize those toxins, it will resist breaking down those fat cells. And that's really important. This is where the elimination diet comes in. So the elimination diet is taking our factory that can handle 100 units a day, but only delivering 20 units a day. That's just kind of normal what we get. What does that mean? 80 extra units of capacity. So what do you think those 80 extra workers do? 
They, because unlike real workers who would just say, great, I'm taking two weeks off, I'll see you later, they still stay at the factory and they start doing extra work. They say, all right, we've got a little bit of extra time. Signal from the boss says, we've got three weeks of this. Because you're the boss. And they, they start saying, oh, actually, I remember back when we were overwhelmed, I stashed some stuff out there. And they go get it. And they process it like it's supposed to be processed. So you clear your accumulated store of toxins. If you've never done an elimination diet before, you might have a significant store of accumulated toxins somewhere in your body. If that's the case, that's where you might experience some of those more, less optimal side effects. But one of the best things we do for our body through the elimination diet is going from 100 units of delivery to 20. And that's where we get things like caffeine, for example. Caffeine isn't inherently bad. In fact, a pretty comprehensive research study just showed that up to five cups of coffee a day is beneficial. Actually protects you from all causes of death. All of them. All of them. And I read that and I thought, man, I can only handle two cups a day. That's my tops. Should I be working up to five? No, don't work up to five. But here's why, even in light of that study, here's why we take caffeine out in the elimination diet. Caffeine is still an alkaloid. It is, in amounts, it's a toxin. It's one we can process. It's a high, it's a hard to process delivery. It's like 40 units. It needs a little extra time to get processed. So we take it out only for that reason. Only for the reason of saying, even though some of those things that come through, you guys know exactly what to do with, but we're still not going to deliver them for the next three weeks so that you can clear old stockpiles and get back to baseline metabolism. Metabolism improves. This is one of the other great benefits of the elimination diet. More energy because you've cleared out all the stores. Your body isn't afraid to use any of its fat stores which is one of its prime sources of energy, because it knows that those are safe places. It knows that if it goes into those fat stores that have something tucked into them, it can handle it, it can process it. So that's why we lose weight. Our body pulls out of storage some of those fat cells that were mostly being held onto for protection more than reserves of energy. How's that sound? Good. Factory analogy work for everybody? Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorites. This works on so many levels. Okay. I think we've covered most of what I wanted to talk about in terms of background to the elimination diet. Now we can get into some of the real hard details of what you're actually going to do. Before we switch, any remaining questions from sort of the background? Yep. For the liver, just to, like how you mentioned that if we eat um, food, Mm -hmm. digestion out of the picture. What could we do to aid that process that the liver has to do to bring up all the stuff and take care of it? What you can do to aid the liver in processing and detoxifying? Detoxifying. The best thing you can do is exactly what we're about to do. When people tell me they want to do a detox, which is why I use this, this word very cautiously, I usually try to talk them into doing this. They say, oh, isn't there something that I can do, a herb or a supplement? that I can do just for a little while that'll help? The answer is not really. Okay. Or it's sure, we can give you a bunch of stimulants and a bunch of laxatives and it's gonna clear out a bunch of stuff, but that's dangerous and not really a good idea. So I don't do that. But in terms of detoxifying, really the only way to effectively do it is to take toxins out for a period of time and eat well. There's not really, I mean, there's, there's some herbs we might talk about. It. There's some herbs that can help but you almost don't even really need them if you're adding in the good and removing the hard to process. Okay. Yeah, people often do want some shortcuts and some things and some supports, but truthfully, if you can do this well, this is as good as it gets for a detoxification of the body. It's also the safest by far, because it's totally safe, and it's the most effective because, not that you continue doing the diet afterwards, but it's sustainable in that it's not as though you've gone from one way to a totally radical change. The change has been slow, progressive, and it becomes sustainable. Yep. Or on the subject of <coughs> shortcuts, what's your opinion on people who get a, a blood test to find other fruits and Ah, uh, great question. As opposed to doing the three weeks. Yep, great question. So the question is, what about 
doing blood tests for sensitivities. They exist, and they're pretty good, actually. I would say they seem to be about 85% reliable, which is high. So sometimes people will say, that's great, I think it's wonderful, I'm not going to do that. I do not want to do that for three weeks. Isn't there a test I can do? Yes, there's a blood test that you can do for food sensitivities. It's pretty reliable. In those cases, I say, okay, that's another route to take. This one's better because you actually do some cleansing and some detoxing. But if someone says, I'm not interested in a detox, I just want to know food sensitivities, that's an option. And it's pretty good. And I think I can say on at least two occasions, it has picked up something that was a less common sensitivity in a difficult case that was actually very useful that I might not have picked up as quickly because it was less common. So I think I've seen that twice. That being said, I've probably only run that test maybe a dozen times. Because usually I try to talk people into doing the old fashioned way. Question here? If someone drinks a cup of coffee yep. and it affects them, like they, they feel anxious or they have, mm -hmm. does that mean that their detoxification pathway through the liver is not working properly? Or how would it mean, usually that means two things. So the question is if you drink a cup of coffee and you feel quite jittery, it usually means actually one of a few things. One, you may just be built more caffeine sensitive. Two, your, detox, your specific detoxification pathways for caffeine may be less than optimal. We actually see a great example of this with alcohol. A certain subset of people of Asian heritage just can't process alcohol, period. They put it in, they don't have the right enzyme set, and they can't break it down. So everyone will have a varying degree to which they can process any given thing. So if you're very sensitive to caffeine, you may just have less of that collection of enzymes. The other thing that's a big part of that, and this kind of almost gets us more into Chinese medicine, is the concept that if you don't have the yin to root the yang, the substance to root the energy, you are more easily disturbed by the addition of something that has a lot of energy, which any of our stimulants like caffeine do. That's certainly another, and quite an exciting lecture, which, I don't know, Laura, are you going to touch on that when you do your lecture? Some of those things? A little bit. Maybe now that I've set you up to do it? <laughs> So Laura's going to do one of the lectures in a couple of weeks. And the concepts of yin and yang, we haven't really mentioned them here, but do play quite a role in, in understanding some of that side of things. Um, there was a question back here. Yep. What are your thoughts on castor oil? Internally? Yeah. There are a number. So the questions are, question is, what are the thoughts on castor oil internally? It's a laxative, a purgative. As are many things. Another way to do it is to take a whole bunch of magnesium, and that will also flush you out. I don't think that they are the best approach, usually because they're just too rough. If you look into Ayurvedic medicine, for example, there's lots of treatments. There are lots of treatments that are quite purgative and laxative. Sometimes those become a good idea. Most of the times those are too extreme. The cost may outweigh the benefit. That's my opinion on a lot of that stuff. Doesn't mean that I haven't occasionally done it. There are cases and situations in which that is the better approach. But unless you're one of those cases, and usually those are pretty extreme, the better route is to take the time and do it in a more sustainable way. Can your body get used to those? Because I've, I've been yep. like using magnesium and mm -hmm. for the other, the other benefit yep. of that uh, elimination. In yep. And it doesn't seem like, does your body get used to Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, your body will, and that's again, this is kind of why this is of a little higher value in that we're not adding anything that your body would get used to. But anything that is added to treat a symptom runs at least the risk or the possibility of your body adapting to it. And this is why, in fact, part of the reason I almost never use supplements in practice is because I've seen just that. We add something, we see good benefit in about a week, and then we see a trailing off of efficacy within six weeks. <coughs> Mostly because if we've just used a supplement to treat a symptom, much like regular medications or anything used to treat a symptom, we see that efficacy fall off. So best is to try to treat the cause, and what you're about to do is as foundational a cause level treatment as exists. Every cell in your body is made from the food you put in and take in. And what we're going to do for the next three weeks is make sure that's as good as it gets. 
Okay, let's talk about some of the details of it, of what you're actually going to do. So take a look and look at the guidelines. You'll also see where you found the guidelines. You will see a collection of recipes that are mostly elimination diet friendly. One person already pointed out one of the recipes has eggs in it. Some of them will have a few things that are not on the list. If that's the case, don't think, aha, I found a loophole to eat eggs. <laughs> Just take the eggs out or don't use that recipe. But there's a pretty good list of recipes there. The list of things to avoid is pretty long and pretty comprehensive. What I want to highlight now are kind of the hard outs, the pretty hard outs, and then where you can be a little more flexible. What do you think the definite avoid to the maximal degree possible list includes? Sugar. Sugar. Someone say booze? Alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> well, sugar, alcohol is sugar. Alcohol is also often, and it's similarly processed to sugar, but yes, alcohol and sugar are high, if not the top of that list. Alcohol, sugar, what else is on the hard out list? Dairy. Dairy, for sure. Wheat. 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 Nightshades. Nightshades are on the next list, but personally I like to slide them into the hard out list. Sugar, alcohol, wheat, dairy, Coughing, sorry, I'm gonna miss it too. And anything with preservatives or artificial foods. But that list is there. You can you can definitely eat meat on this. You can. I believe you are supposed to favor if you look at the most traditional version, turkey the most traditional version has no red meat on it. I leave that actually up to you to decide if you wish to eat some red meat or no red meat. Some versions of it say no red meat, other versions say some lamb is fine but beef is not. My take on that, and this is where you'll have to make some of your own decisions, is try your best, if only during this three weeks, to source all of your food as best you can. You can eat meat on this diet, try to source it as organically as you can, at least for the next three weeks. I know that's more expensive, and I know that's a little less inconvenient. It is getting easier, but try your best during this three weeks to do that. Other than that, I don't put any other restrictions on eating meat. This is not a caloric restriction diet. You need protein to aid detoxification. So your, the amount to which you eat or don't eat meat should be about the same as to what you were doing for the last little while. Don't radically change either one through this process. What if you're on medication? Good question. Yeah, that uh, should have been on my list. If you're on any medications of any sort, do not stop them for this diet. Yep. Table salt. Salt is actually fine. Well, maybe not table salt, but salt is fine. Sea salt is fine. Sea salt is fine. Phew. Yeah. <laughs> You can add some salt. Your body actually is pretty good at processing salt. Yeah. It's not good at processing the amounts that are found in a lot of preserved foods and takeout foods. Mm -hmm. But if you want to add a little bit of salt to your food, that's okay. okay. You get to keep that one. Yep. So the hard out list, say it one more time. Sugar, alcohol, coffee, wheat, dairy, and anything with preservatives. Yep. What about a little bit of really good quality yogurt? If... For uh, I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to raise this point here, because this happens every time. Usually I get an email about this in about three days. It always starts, what about a little bit of good quality this? Here's, here's the answer, the blanket answer to all of that. If you feel like maybe you're trying to sneak something in that's on the off list, just don't have it. It's probably on the off list for a reason. The caveat to that is... If you've done this before and you know you're okay with dairy, that's fine. Truthfully, I have some excellent quality yogurt. I will probably still have a little bit of that because I know I'm not especially sensitive to dairy and I like to have that. Anything that you crave, good chance that's a food to which you're sensitive. That's one of the fastest ways, easiest ways to identify food sensitivities. Usually what you crave the most is that to which you are sensitive. If you crave, well, no, I won't fill that in. Whatever you crave, mm -hmm. take a look at that. Yep. Well, with cravings, mm -hmm. though, isn't that our body also telling us intuitively that we need that nutrient? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> other times, it's other things telling us we want that food. 
I read actually just recently, I read something about specifically food cravings and that idea. And the, the person who's writing the article actually called it a myth because they said, if you were craving chocolate because you needed magnesium, it would make far more sense to crave a different food much higher in magnesium than it would be to crave chocolate, right? If you're craving nachos, <laughs> which I admit to occasionally craving, there's probably some other food that would satisfy that. So usually our food cravings are either a sensitivity that has become an addictive pattern or something a little more psychological. What do you do about eating out? Mostly you don't do it for the next three weeks. That being said, if that's not realistic for you, and this is a really important part of the whole experience, use what we would call a harm reduction model. Optimize as best you can within the framework of your real life. Some of you will do this diet fully. Others will have to make some small compensations, consolations. That's okay. If you do this 80%, you get 80% of the benefit. If you do it 100%, you get 100%. That's great. But you will definitely get out what you put in. If you have to sacrifice or compromise a few things, that's okay. Do the best you can. The next list is kind of short, but they are the three other things. They're not quite on the hard out list, but... Do your best for total avoidance of these. Some of these have already been named. What do you think they might be? Nightshades. nightshades. What's the nightshades? Nightshades. Good question. What are the nightshades? The nightshades are peppers, Pepper. eggplants, tomatoes, and to some degree potatoes, although potatoes are pretty mild. If you want to have a little bit of potato, that's actually okay. The other ones, though, aim for 100% out. So we've got the nightshade vegetables, We've got eggs, and the last one in that group is actually citrus fruit. Mm -hmm. That's much like eggs. Citrus fruit is something that some people are totally fine with. But the people that are sensitive to citrus tend to be very sensitive to citrus, and it can actually cause a lot of not-so-great stuff in the digestion. You'll see if you look at the recipes, some of them will have lemon zest or a squeeze of orange or something like that. That's not a big deal if you have add a little bit of that. But if you regularly eat grapefruits, oranges, etc., take them out for the next three weeks. If you have a hot lemon drink every morning? If that's a good question. This one comes up. If you have a hot lemon drink every morning and you know that you're generally okay with that, that's okay. If you're not sure, take it out. Okay. And have hot ginger in the morning you know fine and that's another important point try to find substitutes for the things you love but also know this there's no substitute for coffee there just isn't mm -hmm. there's no substitute for chocolate or pizza it's not going to happen <laughs> be prepared over the next three weeks to simply not satisfy those cravings try to find something else that is close and helps but just simply know that your life will be less delicious for the next three weeks. <laughs> One of the other things that happens, though, is your taste receptors will actually improve as you cease to bombard them with a lot of these really st strong flavors. So you'll actually find, after about a week, usually, that you actually are tasting more from your food. And a lot of people really enjoy that. And some people, you'll find this when you have your first sweet after the elimination diet, it tastes almost grossly sweet. You're like, oh God, this is too much. And you have one every day for another week and by the end you're having two. Sugar is in fruits, let's touch on that. Sugar is in fruit, fruit is okay. Limit it to a couple pieces a day of fruit. And then you might say, perfect, I will just have those really sweet mango slices <laughs> or, or dates or figs. Two is okay. I think one year I accidentally said five, and the whole group held me to it the whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, you said five. I'm going with two. Fruit is fine. Fruit sugar is processed a little bit differently. However, if you have enough of it, it still will have the same effect. But don't worry too much about fruits. Just try to limit it to two pieces of fruit a day. That's fine. Yep. Like dark berries? Fine. Yep, you can have as much of those as you want. They're quite low in the glycemic index. When I say two pieces of fruit a day, mostly I mean the really sweet fruits, and most of those are the tropical fruits. Yep. Frozen fruit? Fine. 
And how about herbal teas? As much as you like. As long as it doesn't have caffeine in it, you can have whatever herbal teas you want. If some of you want to do something like a herbal cleanse alongside, by all means, go ahead. They can be quite nice, quite helpful. But it's certainly not something you have to do. As long as you stay hydrated, you're going to be okay. Yep? What about the, some of the powders, like coffee substitute powder? As long as it's not caffeinated, that's okay. Okay. And then, like, protein powders? Protein powders, if you're already taking them, that's all right. Yeah, that's a good question. Take a look at it. Make sure it doesn't have anything in it that you maybe don't want. I might say for the next three weeks, don't do it because they can be pretty high process orders. But I'll, I'll leave that you to two individuals to make that decision. <coughs> plantain? Oh, like the banana plantain? Bananas are generally out. Plantain... Close enough, cousin, that it's also a <laughs> nice try. Is that because people are sensitive to it? Yeah. If you, if you already totally know you're not sensitive to bananas or plantain, you can leave them in. But if you don't know, take them out. I actually personally am quite sensitive to bananas. Me too. Yeah. And usually if you're sensitive to banana, you're also sensitive to avocado and coconut. Those three go together. And if those are something you ate a lot of, I heard a sigh. If you just sighed to that, probably you're sensitive to those. Sorry, if you love those. Yep. Stevia. Stevia is fine. I personally think it tastes kind of gross, but you can have as much of it as you want. Wow. Cocoa yeah. powder? Chocolate powder? If it has no sugar in it, you can have as much. Uh, it has a little caffeine in it. Don't go crazy, but it's a little bit fine. So there's no honey, right? There's no honey, no agave, no maple syrup, nothing Sweet. Sweet. And if you feel like you're trying to find something that's sweet, probably you shouldn't have it. So one other question. Yeah, go ahead. Raw cacao. Raw cacao is fine. Yep. I like to roast it personally. I find it a little more flavorful, but that's fine. Oh, this is something else I was going to mention. A lot of people will start eating a lot of nut butters through this. Mm -hmm. You can do that. That's fine. If you have too much nut butter, your stool will get loose. Don't have too much nut butter or too many nuts. Particularly if you're going to have nuts or nut butter, favor the roasted. It's actually much like cooking a food. You get a little more out of it and you deactivate some of the not-so-good stuff in it, particularly phytic acid. The other thing I wanted to mention, this will be close to the end, uh, can you have decaf coffee if you wish? Yep, you can. Can't put anything in it, but you, you can have decaf if you want. Isn't there a little bit of caffeine? When it's done properly, and usually the best way to do it is the Swiss water method, there's a little bit of caffeine, but it's okay. I mentioned this here only to forestall the emails I get. Not tomorrow, but in like three or four days. It's like, ah, uh, can I have decaf? Uh, so I say, I preface it now to say, if you need to, it's okay. If you don't have to, don't do it. Just take the whole thing out altogether. But if you have to have something, then a little bit of decaf, a cup of decaf black is all right. Yep. Oats? Or fine. You can have oats. No problems there. Yep. Um, kombucha is high in sugar. It is. So would you take it out completely? Yeah, I would. But that's a good example of it. It's not like it's inherently a bad food. It's just high in sugar, so we want to keep sugar very, very minimal or out. All right. We're going to wrap it up there because we've been here for about an hour, and that's when about people get start to feel a little antsy. So we wrap it up there, but of course I'll be here for a while. If you have other questions, particularly specific, this food or that food, I'll see if I can answer those for you. Otherwise, that's it. This is exciting. I hope you're thrilled to be starting the 2016 Elimination Diet Challenge. Good luck to all of you. Stay as strong as you can. <laughs>